بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى الصراط المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقدره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا متقبلا خالصا من وجهك الكريم اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستوفيك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Alright, so inshallah we will start um, by introducing you. So we have today Stada Maryam Amir. She has received her master's degree in education from UCLA. She holds a second bachelor's degree in Islamic studies through Al Azhar University. Stada Maryam has studied in Egypt, memorized the Quran, and has researched a variety of religious studies ranging from Quranic exegesis. Islamic jurisprudence, prophetic narrations and commentary, women's rights within Islamic law, and more. For the past 15 years, she holds a second degree, black belt of Taekwondo, mashallah, and speaks multiple languages. We'll be discussing the Qariya app, inshallah, today. Um, it is um, an app that was released in Ramadan. About 60 women beside this on the app, if I'm not mistaken. And oh, they're from all over the world. So it's um, a pleasure to meet with you today. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to answer some questions. Thank you. It's such a great honor, alhamdulillah, to have a conversation about Qariya specifically, alhamdulillah. Thank you. All right, so we'll get started with the first question. Um, how would you describe your relationship with the Quran and how has it just um, transformed throughout the years? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. When I was growing up, I had a lot of emphasis from my parents about loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I didn't really feel a connection with Islam in general. And I didn't know if I wanted to identify as Muslim. And I think like a lot of, you know, young people, I was trying to figure out who I was and what my beliefs were. Um, alhamdulillah, I had the incredible honor of going to Mecca. And when I came back, I just wanted to hold on to that relationship with Allah. That experience helped me realize I want to know who he is. And so I started reading the Quran. And that was the very first time I really read the Quran for myself. I had not touched the Quran at that point for many years. And I could barely read it in Arabic. And I didn't understand what I was reading. And when I started reading it in the Arabic, I really struggled because I hadn't even attempted reading Arabic in years. It would take me hours to read even a little bit. And so my mom suggested I read it in the translation. And that is when my life changed. Reading the Quran in translation, being able to understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to me, help me want to just know it more and memorize it and live it and love it and teach it. And it was an addicting experience. It is subhanAllah, just going to school and then coming home and reading words that mirrored my experience at school. It just felt like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with me and that, you know, he, he knew what I was going through and that he was there to care for me and support me. And as a young person, especially those experiences are huge. They're subhanAllah, they are fundamental, but also just the, the miracle of the Quran, the miraculous nature of the language. When I learned Arabic and learned the power of the words themselves, the way that, you know, the, 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 just the language of the Quran itself is a miracle. The, the, the secrets within the Quranic, uh, rhetoric, the, 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 the structure, everything is just so powerful. SubhanAllah. So Alhamdulillah, that, that was really the start of my journey. And I think that many people might have a story of starting. They're starting and they're excited. They're starting and they want to begin. And they're, you know, they have these moments where they're like so into the Quran. But then a lot of times I'm asked the question about what if I used to be that way and now I've changed? You know, what if I felt that way at one point, but I've, I've dipped? And I hear this a lot too. And I know that, you know, subhanAllah, we all go through ups and downs in our lives, but the one thing with the Quran is that it's always there for us, even when we struggle. And that's what I felt in my life, that there are times where my connection with the Quran is not the same as I want it to be. It's not where I want it to be. 
And there are times in my life where I have felt nothing weightier than the guilt of not doing the Quran that I want to do. And so when I share with you, like what, it, when you ask me, what is my relationship with the Quran? I would say it's a relationship. It is literally a relationship like any relationship for all of us. There are times where we are so devoted to someone. And then there are times where because of something that we're going through, we step back for a minute and we reevaluate. How do I reconnect with this person? How do I work through something that I'm going through in my relationship with this person? And so when, when I'm looking at the Quran, sometimes I sit back and I think, what am I supposed to do in my relationship right now? Of course, there are certain things like reviewing aspects of the Quran. There are reviews. There are reciting to a teacher. I still work with a teacher daily. I still review all the time. That's a journey that's forever. But then there are other aspects like what about listening in a particular way? What about contemplating in a particular way? And I think like any relationship, there are going to be things that we maybe need to do to, um, you know, build aspect of a relationship that we haven't yet learned about the quran is never a book that we can know fully ever there's always something to learn and to grow and to know and so i would i would describe it as a constantly growing relationship that there are times that i sit back and reevaluate what i need to do to grow in my relationship with the quran and it's a dua that i'm making and i i i completely um I completely understand when people say, you know, that there were times in their lives where they felt so connected and other times that they didn't. I've gone through that too. But alhamdulillah for the honor that the Quran always loves, Allah always loves for us to recite the Quran, that he always loves to hear our voice reciting the Quran. And knowing that alhamdulillah, even when I feel unworthy of the Quran, I feel like I know that he loves for me to go back to it. And so alhamdulillah, it's something that I'm trying. May Allah help us all uh, increase our relationship with the Quran. And, Ameen. Ameen. and how did your love for the Quran and for reciting Quran and listening to Quran grow and develop? You know, I think there are so many different aspects of um, building a relationship. And one of the things that I used to do even when I couldn't really understand, is I would hold the Quran like a hug. I would just hold it and and just like hold it to my heart. I would, when I would sleep, I would put it next to me in bed just so that I could be physically near it. And the reason why I share that with you is because a lot of people when coming to the Quran may approach it from a place of um, having had trauma in the past or not knowing how to open the book or not even knowing where to begin. And I want to share that because I think physical touch is a really important aspect of building, um, building, building a relationship with a, a book that we can, inshallah, truly take as our best friend. When we don't have the words or when we don't have the ability to even express how we feel, we can just hug it. We can hold it. We can lie down and put it next to us and put our hand on it and just know that it's close to us. My teacher, Sheikh Mahib Fulda, he always talks about how just looking at the Mus'haf is worship. Longingly gazing at the Quran is worship. Holding the Mus'haf itself is worship. That love that you express simply by the physical touch of the Mus'haf, it's a form of worship. And so one, that was one aspect of it. It was just spending physical time with the book itself, going to the beach and holding the mushaf on a walk on the beach, going to a cafe and, you know, drinking, drinking some tea and, and just holding the mushaf there. That experience, it's an experiential experience. It's not just a book that I'm going to read super fast while I'm, you know, sitting in a corner in my room. That's one aspect of it. Yes. But also take the Quran out with you, hold it and 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 go out with it subhanallah it's worship to love holding it so that's one aspect i think the other aspect was really being able to um focus on the understanding again i didn't know what i was reciting in the beginning and reading it in the translation was what changed my life and so as i was memorizing the quran i was 
sometimes memorizing it without knowing what I was saying, but other times I was reading the English translation and just trying to understand how those words apply to my life. A lot of times when I was memorizing, I was trying to think of the way that this verse actually applies to my day to day, or how did the companions experience this verse, or what did the companions do for this verse? And that you know, imagining the, the Quran in that experiential way of what was it like when it was revealed? How does this apply to me right now? All of those things help me with actually feeling like I am seeing the Quran, feeling the Quran, living with the Quran. So just understanding, of course, reading tafsir. now that alhamdulillah, I do speak and understand Arabic, I read tafsir all the time. So commentaries of the Quran. What does this verse actually mean? And that, of course, just deepens my love for the Quran because when you read the, the words themselves, they're so powerful. But then when you read the words and you are understanding what the context for the revelation is, subhanAllah, especially I would say as a woman, for me, that was so transformative. And one of the aspects that really increased this connection for me was this, 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 the way that my teacher, Sheikh Mahib Fudal, taught me to recite the Quran as a woman specifically, because so many of my teachers in the past had focused on memorization, had focused on review, but his focus was on as a woman, the Quran is for you. As a woman, the Quran loves to hear your voice. As a woman, the Quran loves to have a relationship with someone who comes to it and comes with everything to it. And subhanAllah, that aspect of helping me see the Quran as my worship as a believer who's a woman really shifted a particular aspect of the connection that I had with the Quran, subhanAllah. Thank you for showing that. Thank you for asking. Why did you decide to develop the Qari app and what was your visions and hopes for that? Qari'a is, as you mentioned, a woman Quran reciters app. Alhamdulillah, we have over 60 women from around the world on the app. Typically abled women, disabled women. Alhamdulillah, we have women from all different backgrounds, countries, realities. Um, SubhanAllah, it's been such a gift and an honor to bring so many different voices. And when I first was thinking about the app, there were a number of different objectives. So one of them was just showcasing women who are expert Quran reciters, myself not included, everyone else, mashallah, all of the women are women who are just subhanAllah. These are, these are women who, when you listen to them, you can tell that they have spent years and years and years honing the art of recitation. And these are women who, mashallah, many of them have won on international stages many times over. Many of them have recited on television in competitions where they are the judges of the competition. So mashallah, the, the, the level of recitation is not something I was exposed to growing up from women. The only woman I heard growing up reciting the Quran was actually, well, one, my mother, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless her. Um, but many of us have that story, mashallah, where we've heard our moms, you know, mashallah, recite the Quran and, and that's such, such a gift for many of us who've experienced it. And it's a point of sadness for those who haven't and those who wish that they had experienced it. And may Allah bless all of our mothers. Mm -hmm. And then um, we have, uh, alhamdulillah, in our community, um, mashallah, you know, women who would recite the Quran in a woman's um, setting where they were teaching. So I heard, I heard, you know, in a woman's section, kind of like a more quiet voices reciting the Quran. These were not loud voices of recitation. They were quiet voices together, which was beautiful and amazing. But I, you know, that experience is different from hearing a woman recite on stage with other women in a competition for women's recitation, or even for women and men's recitation, which is normal all around the world. And I had not experienced that. I had never even seen that existed. And so for me, subhanAllah, what really was um, one of the objectives of the app was to help women and little girls specifically grow up with a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old grow up saying, yes, I've heard women recite the Quran from all over the world. Yes, some of them have very deep voices. Some of them have very light voices. Some of them, the range of voices are all in between. Something I struggled with a lot is my voice is very deep when I recite because I've only been imitating men reciters who are amazing, 
who are our teachers, Minshawi, Abdul Basid, Hussari. You cannot get better than them. May Allah have mercy on all of them. These are our teachers. But as a woman trying to mimic their voice, I, I, my voice is very deep because of it. And I'm always being told, soften your voice, try to soften it, try to enlighten it. And I'm like, how? I don't know how. I've been trying to mimic men's recitation for so long. But now, alhamdulillah, being able to hear women whose voices are similar pitches to mine, I've been trying to work on lightening my voice and sounding more natural, sounding more like a flowy recitation. But beyond just reciting like other women, it's really subhanAllah, being able to see women recite can help you know that you can do it too. And that was really one of the, 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 the ultimate objective of the app was to help women know that they can be women of the Quran. When I was traveling throughout the, United, the, the UK, um, I was giving lectures in all these different cities, myself and um, Dr. Jinan Yusuf, who's the author of Reflecting on the Names of Allah, an incredible book connecting the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your daily life. So I really recommend Reflecting on the Names of Allah by Dr. Jinan Yusuf. She and I were traveling from one city to the next, and it were all women's, all women's events, and I was reciting the Quran and all of these events for women, and subhanAllah, the amount of women that came to me afterwards, just absolutely emotional, saying this is the very first time they've ever heard a woman recite the Quran. And had they known that woman could recite the Quran, that they too would have tried to follow being Quran reciters. They, so many of them told me that they were singers in their high school choir, or they were mothers and they were singing lullabies to their children. And they love singing, but they had no idea that a woman could also recite the Quran. And I know that sounds silly because we think, well, we all know that the Quran is for men and women. But when you couple that knowledge with, oh, but one day a woman is not going to become an imam. She's going to forget the Quran. That's sinful. Oh, one day a woman is going to become a mother potentially, and she's not going to have time to review. And it's sinful to forget the memorization. So she shouldn't memorize in the first place. Oh, she's never going to lead tarawih. So where is she going to be reciting? I've heard those statements from women so often. The culture surrounding men's recitation is one where men are encouraged. Men have so many role models of who they can be. Men have so many different uh, tones, intonations. He sounds like me. I'm going to follow him. Quite literally hundreds, if not thousands of options. A woman don't, many women, many women don't even know one, not even one. And so when we don't see who we can be, sometimes we don't even know we can be them. Going through the UK honestly was a turning point for me because I, I know that I haven't really heard women reciting except for in those you know wonderful circles of halakas where we recited kind of quietly. And I know that I've been through events when I traveled, like when I went to Sweden, Canada, different places. You know, these are Muslim communities in the West where I'm speaking with women and they're telling me, we've never heard a woman recite. You're the first person we've heard. And when I'm hearing this over and over in these random countries, I'm thinking, okay, that's a theme. But then when I went to the UK and it was hundreds of women in every event, every day it's a new city and it's the same exact message. At that point, I was like, subhanAllah, this is, this is something we need to change. And it's very specific to the West because when we look at countries like Indonesia, when we look at countries like Nigeria, Morocco, Singapore, Malaysia, the Gambia, Yemen, there are countries all over the world, Tanzania, where subhanAllah, women's recitation, if not as a culture throughout the whole country is the norm, there are aspects of that country where it's the norm. Mm -hmm. So when I was exposed to hearing about the norm of all of these different countries where women are reciters, they grow up from the time that they're three and they are told, you know, when you are in school, here we have PE as an option, not as an option, but we take PE, physical education. We have to take it in school. And then some schools have options. You can take home ec or you can take auto shop or you can take all these different options as your extracurricular assignments or classes for school. In those countries, there, you know, for example, in Singapore, Sara Atiqa Suhimi, who is one of the reciters on the app, she's a graduate from Al Azhar, she told me that their options are maqamat. So maqama is like making their recitation, you know, certain levels, the emotion that comes through in recitation. She said that when you are in elementary school, little girls and little boys, 
They are taking maqamat. It's a school subject. SubhanAllah, their recitation is the next level. It's not the recitation of someone who's reciting to a sheikh like me. It's a recitation of someone who you are seeing the verses revealed when you're listening to these voices. And when that's their culture, from the time they're little girls, they are being exposed to the encouraging culture of women, little girls, hearing women recite, their teachers are women who are reciting like this. SubhanAllah, we see the, 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 who they produce. We see who is produced from cultures like this. And so for me, realizing that so many women have never even seen women reciting, just like me, where I hadn't either, that's when I started a campaign online. It was called the Four Mothers Campaign, where we were reciting the Qur'an. And as we were reciting the Qur'an on Instagram, I was asking other women to share their recitations and that I would share their recitations. So alhamdulillah, we started creating this you know, experience where women were hearing other women. And it was very clear that this is for women. You know, Any man is welcome to, to block me, to scroll past. You don't need to look at the page. It's a responsibility on men not to, to listen. Even though there's a difference of opinion in fiqh, there's a difference of opinion. Sheikh bin Baz himself uh, has a fatwa where it's allowed for men to listen to the recitation of women. So this is a discussion in fiqh that's been going on since centuries ago. We have Imam al-Bujayrini, um, Ibn Muflah al-Maqdisi. These are scholars who existed in the 700s and the 1100s from the Shafi'is and the Hanbalis centuries ago have been discussing women's recitation and the permissibility or when men shouldn't listen. So this isn't a new discussion. But I shared that this is for women, by women, and it's targeted to women. And so subhanAllah, so many women, I mean, thousands of women were listening and that experience of hearing from women, receiving messages from women that this isn't just impacting their Quran. They're starting to pray. They're starting to you know, worship Allah in ways that they hadn't ever in the past or that they hadn't in a really, really long time. And alhamdulillah, because of that, I started interviewing these women from around the world, asking them to share their stories. And the more that women shared their stories, the more that my questions went from, are women actually given a role in Islam? For Muslim women, these are the questions I constantly get. Doubts from Muslim women about women's roles in Islam. And they shifted to saying things like, I used to think that. But after seeing all these women that you've interviewed from all around the world reciting the Quran, I know that there's a space in Islam for women. Alhamdulillah, messages like that made me realize that it needs to go beyond just my Instagram page. It needs to become something that's accessible to women everywhere. That has nothing to do with me, but that just makes Quran accessible for women no matter where they are. And so alhamdulillah, the next step was creating the app and the objectives, one of just helping so many women, inshallah, access women's recitation, but also two, to be a place of healing. Because like I mentioned, so many of those questions were why aren't women honored in Islam? From women, Muslim women were asking me this question, hundreds of women. And now, alhamdulillah, just being able to have that question shift and say, now I feel like we are, now I see that we are. Maybe my experiences haven't reflected that as a person who might live in a particular area. But we can see that women from around the world are in these spaces. They are the teachers in these spaces. They are the judges in these spaces. And alhamdulillah, being able to see that has, I'm grateful to say, has been a, a means of healing for so many of us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, it's great to have opportunities here because I think that's what blocks people from connecting with the Quran. They don't have the knowledge. Or they don't have access to people who are sharing these things with them. Absolutely, subhanAllah. From an app development perspective, how do you even go about starting with this idea? Especially, like, how do you even start an app? Like, where do you go? Who do you subhanAllah. Ask? Yes, that was literally my question because I, I was not involved in tech by any stretch of imagination. So I had no idea. I uh, Last Ramadan, Ramadan uh, 2021, I was making dua just subhanAllah. That, the, the idea of Qariya came in Ramadan of 2021. And I was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last 10 nights. Like, oh Allah, please facilitate for me to be able to put out this app of women's Quran recitation. And so towards the end of Ramadan, I started looking for how to begin, uh, you know, putting together an app. Um, we started contacting different people asking if they know any developers and at that time, I didn't know anyone who could develop an app like this. 
I kept asking until Alhamdulillah, there was a brother who wants to stay unnamed because mashallah, he's very, very humble. Um, but he's involved with one of the major Quran apps and sites. Um, mashallah, it's, it's an incredible effort. And so I contacted him and asked him if he knows of a developer and he recommended he recommended working with, uh, are you good? <laughs> Your voice is gone though. Oh, sorry, my Wi-Fi went out. Oh, no problem. Should I go back though? Um, it's up to you. I think it's still recorded, so. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so he recommended working with someone whose name is Shadi Sharif. Shadi Sharif is the developer for Qari'a. Mashallah, he is an incredible developer. And it's only by Allah's gift and mercy that we were connected with him because he's not just a developer. He is someone who's very invested in the message. He's very invested in the idea. And so may Allah bless him. He invested countless hours, night and day. He lives in Dubai. And he would call me, you know, for, for doing meetings, like he'd be working at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Like we would just, you know, subhanAllah, as we were, as we were releasing the app, there was so much we needed to finish. And we'd just sit for like five hours straight working together on the different types of aspects that we needed to deal with on the app. And it's like four in the morning, his time. And he's been working all day and all night. SubhanAllah, may Allah bless him. He was just so committed to this cause of, you know, helping women access the Quran. MashaAllah, he has a daughter. May Allah bless him. And so especially as a father with a daughter, I think knowing that, you know, things shift for you as a parent, as any parent, especially looking at your children and what, what resources are available to them. May Allah bless him so much. Mm -hmm. And so for him, alhamdulillah, being able to connect with him and say, this is what we want to develop and he had already developed Dr. Fadl Sule Dr. Fadl Suleiman as a translator of the Quran. And he has an app called the Bridges International app. And he's, mashallah, he's, a, he, he's done a number of different apps as well. Um, and so because Shadi had already developed a Quran app with many different riwayat of the Quran and recitations of the Quran, Dr. Fadl Suleiman had already wanted to include a woman's recitation. So they had been reciting, a recording with Sheikh Zainab Talha who is on um, our app as well, alhamdulillah. So they've already been doing some of this work, mashallah. So Shadi had already been familiar with, you know, some of the aspects of the app that we wanted to do, mashallah. So alhamdulillah, being connected with him was the opening. And then there was so much to learn for me as someone who had not been involved in any of this, like, what is a UX design? Like so much of like what I need to develop, we would write the back end. So as an app owner, what do I want the app to do in this aspect? As an app user, what do I want the app to do in this aspect? So there was a lot of like writing and vision and consulting with as many people as possible to be able to get to what we want the app to just do. And this is only the first stage. There are so many things that we want the app to go towards. Alhamdulillah, the app has been only released for about seven weeks at this point. So it's just the start of the of the of the beginning, inshallah. But we have we we spoke about the long-term vision from from that time, from last year, on what we want to do. And then from there, after working with him, he created a back end. So the back end is where we put up all the recitations. If you open the app, you're gonna see. Every Qari'a has her picture, information about her, and then she has her recordings. And so he developed the website where we put in all of that information. So myself and Sadia Hassan and uh, all of the team at Qari'a who are all volunteers, may Allah bless every single one of them. Um, they are, what we do is we receive the recordings from the reciters and then we do the editing and we do all of the, like for example, uh, when Qari'a Farah Amshishu sent us Surat Al-An'am, I mean, that's a very long surah and she didn't send it all in one piece, of course. She's sending it from Morocco. It's being sent in different segments. And so what we have to do is listen to all of it, put it together and make sure there's no, you know, doubles. Sometimes when we're putting it together, we might accidentally put it together too close and we slice out one letter. Then we have to start over and make sure that we, we are able to catch every single aspect of it. We remove any background noise. Like for example, if I'm reciting here at home, 
and someone is walking and you hear, you know, a, a door closing, we're trying our best to remove all of those sounds. Reciting a very long surah is going to have a lot of, <clears throat> so we're trying to remove all of that. It's a long process to do the editing and alhamdulillah after the editing, then it's trying to make it sound more professional because we sent mics around the world. We sent mics to the Gambia and Yemen and Nigeria and to Morocco and to Algeria and subhanallah, the majority of the mics did not work with the phones, even though before we sent them, we checked online to make sure we asked every party, like, what is your phone use and, you know, type and make, does it work with this? We sent connectors to make sure it would all work. And alhamdulillah, it didn't. Um, and every mic has its own story. I mean, it took months to get mics to where they are now, literally months. The only mic package that um, didn't take as long was Morocco because there was a sister, may Allah bless Ines. Um, so there's a sister, a friend of mine named Deanna, she was studying in, 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 um, in Egypt. She's, a, she's uh, an American who's studying there. She came back to America and when she came back, she said she has a friend named Ines who's visiting from Morocco. And I was like, per, like, alhamdulillah, let's send mics with her. Deanna was so kind to ask Ines. She was such, so, so generous to offer. It's a big thing to take a bunch of mics on an international trip. It's like no easy task. Seriously, may Allah bless her so much. So she took the mics to Morocco and then she mailed them to every Qariya because Morocco is big and not all of them live in her city. So alhamdulillah, because of Inas, may Allah bless her so much, we got the mics through Morocco. Some of the women and some of the Qariyas in Morocco, the mics worked for them, but some of them didn't. So that was Morocco's story. But to get the mic into Algeria, Morocco and Algeria don't have easy um, uh, mail between them, even though they're so close to one another. So people, the Qariyas in Algeria told me, don't send it through Morocco, because if you're going to send it through Morocco, there's going to be months and months and months before it gets to us. And it may not get to us because of the, the mail situation there. So alhamdulillah, we had, um, I posted on Instagram and I asked, does anyone know anyone going to Algeria? And this wonderful sister from Dubai told me that she has a brother who's going to Algeria from San Francisco. So subhanAllah, I mailed the mics to him, but he wasn't going for like another two months. So by the time he left and then met the, you know, Qariyas in Algeria, alhamdulillah, we finally got the mics to them, but the mics didn't work for them. Subhanallah, there's a problem with the, the mic. I don't know what is going on. Um, the mic to get into the Gambia, um, Deanna took one of the mics with her, but first she went to Saudi, then she went to Egypt, then she had to hand it off to someone from Egypt who's going into the Gambia. So then they, that person went into the Gambia and then that person had to meet someone else in the Gambia. So each, every, and then Yemen is a war zone. So getting the mic into Yemen, it was a relief organization called Mercy Relief, an amazing organization. Mercy Relief is, mashallah, a trusted, incredible organization where they work directly on the ground. They um, are helping the, the people of Yemen directly and they are a, um, a verified organization from the UK. So alhamdulillah, we know that they, you know, they're working very closely with the people and they're working to make sure that the funds are not frozen or something like that in the process. Mm -hmm. So mashallah, may Allah bless, um, bless Ustad Muhammad from Mercy Relief. He bought the mic himself and then it started its many months journey. I think to get the mic to Yemen took six months because by the time he got it and then went through one country after a next, one country after a next, Allahu Akbar, that mic has a very long journey before I got into Yemen. So, and then once it got into Yemen, it took a while to get to the Qariya in Yemen. Every single person had their own journey with the mic, but despite all of this, as I mentioned multiple times, subhanAllah, the, most of them didn't work. So what we did instead is um, had the Qariyas use their phones, but of course, the phones in every place is different. The quality and the what the accessibility is all very different. So what we try to do is we try our best to make it sound like a professional mic on our end. So we're not trying to add an echo to make the voice echoey for an effect. We're just trying to make it sound not tinny because when you record on your phone, it can sound very tinny. So we try to change the, 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 the recording a little bit so that it sounds like as if it's coming from a, from a professional mic. And obviously I learned GarageBand when I was trying to do the For, For Mothers campaign. GarageBand is an editing um, uh program uh mm -hmm. for app for 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 mac and then sadia hassan knows audacity and so she's she's doing audacity neither of us are professional uh we're not sound engineers <laughs> we're not like djs we don't we don't we're trying our best and mashallah there was a brother who is a professional sound engineer who gave us a training who helped us try to learn you know how to like improve in that but it's a journey. We're at the very beginning. We are all volunteers. Inshallah, long term, we're only going to get better. 
But alhamdulillah, I'm very, very grateful that the reception has been so, so wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I, I just saw an application today that there was a new recitation from someone. Yeah. So it's, really, it's really fun getting the Oh, so. I'm glad that you get the push notifications. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, I think we touched on, on this a little bit earlier, but who was the target audience of your app, women or men or everyone? Women are the target audience. Women are the, the you know, the app... Um, the the app is by women for women it's women's recitations for women um mm -hmm. one of the slogans of the app is finally a quran app for our daughters and so really women are the are the target audience of the app of course there are going to be men who hear women's reciting for example if i'm listening to recitations as i'm editing them and then they're out loud my husband is going to hear there are men in you know different homes who are going to hear and again one, the majority of the app reciters are public reciters in their country. They recite on television with their sheikh, or they are the sheikha of the sheikh, mm -hmm. and they are reciting on television. And it's part of their, you know, sco the scholars of their countries approve this and they support this based on the fiqh. And we have a fiqh, you know, clarification um, on Qari'a. You can go to www.qariah.app, Qari'a.app. And that um, website has an FAQ. You can look at the frequently asked questions. We go through all the fiqh and the different discussions of the scholars. If anyone would like to learn more, inshallah. But the majority of these reciters are public reciters in their countries. When I told them when I first announced the app, it was in January of 2022. I had a video where, alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful. I was in uh, in Mecca. I took a video in front of the Kaaba and I shared the announcement of the app. And alhamdulillah, it was met with so much support, mashallah, so much excitement. I just like this disbelief from so many people like, are you serious? A woman's app just for a woman? I, I can't even believe this is real. And I think a lot of people told me that they expected to hear like five or six women. They had no idea that there were so many. Alhamdulillah, we're adding more as well, inshallah. Um, but the there was also people who said, what are you talking about? An app for women of Quran? You already have men. Why do you need women? Like, what is this? Like, just this like confusion and women shouldn't be heard by men. Of course, we heard that even though we were very clear, this is an app for women. It's for women. We still got that. And when I told this to the Qariyas in the different countries, their reaction was, but why <laughs> Why would they say women shouldn't recite in front of men? They had never heard this before. These are women who are women of Quran, hafidhas of Quran, ijazah in Quran. They teach Quran. They work with Quran scholars all the time. They are scholars sometimes even in fiqh and hadith and other sciences. And subhanAllah, they so many of them were like, we've never heard that before. What do you mean women shouldn't recite in front of men? Where does that come from? And when I told one of the Qariyas um, from Morocco, she said she's going to go to the senior scholars of Morocco who make fatawa and ask them about this. And all of the senior scholars of Morocco who make fatawa, their reaction was, how could they say that men shouldn't listen to women? Of course, women and men can listen to Quran together. They were so like, their reaction was, why would they say this? Which to me was so shocking because that's not what, you know, both of us probably haven't grown up with that type of um, <laughs> reaction. So, so one, most of these women recite publicly in the first place. That's the first thing. From the fiqh, there's a difference of opinion. And their, their scholars of their countries don't have a problem with women reciting in front of men. And so it's part of their cultural norm. That being said, this app is very shocking for people in our part of the world. It is not the norm here. Mm -hmm. And we are, you know, with all due respect and love and sincerity and sisterly goodness and dua to my brothers, um, this app is not for men. It's for women who don't have access to women's recitation. Now, if a man is going to hear, overhear it as a woman is playing the Quran, and, you know, if a man, honestly, even if a man downloads the app, like, again, there's a difference of opinion. These women recite in front of men, not a big deal, but mm -hmm. it's not targeted to men. It's for women and it's for, you know, the boys and the girls who, inshallah, will grow up with a new norm of, of course, you know, women should be Quran reciters. This is part of what we've grown up with since we were little kids and women deserve to be, you know, in these spaces of Quran as well. And I think something that I think is really important for me to clarify 
as an app developer, my goal is not to change a whole system that works for a particular country. There are women who don't want men to hear their recitation. There are women who don't want men to hear them reciting. I'm not trying to suggest that women should recite in front of men at all. I'm sharing that there's a difference of opinion in fiqh. In these countries, they do that. Whatever works for that community or country, great, do that. But this app is for women. The change and the revolution should be for women to feel connected to the Quran, for women to be able to recite the Quran to their children, for women to say, I grew up with my mother reciting the Quran as she was cooking and as she was, as she was, you know, driving and, and as she was going to work, she recited the Quran in this beautiful, melodious voice. And I miss that. And I want that too. being able to shift. And, and of course, not just mothers. There are so many women who aren't mothers and who are not going to be mothers. May Allah bless all of them. But whoever, you know, for our personal interaction with the Quran and that the generational impact of that, I've had so many little girls through their, you know, their aunt or their, their mom or someone send me a message. And it's just the cutest thing to hear their voices sending me a voice note on Instagram saying that they've memorized a surah now, or they want to be a hafid of Quran or they want to be a qari'ah. And the app just came out. The app just came out and this is the reaction of these little girls. That's the culture that this app wants to create, inshallah. That, uh, that culture where, you know, these little boys and little girls are reciting together and they're reciting with their parents and they're excited to recite and they want to be qariyas too. Little girls want to be qariyas too. And inshallah, I, I pray that, that we can create that culture with it, inshallah. For sure. And if they want to be reciters, they don't have to be public reciters. They could be they could do it for Allah's sake only. Of course, absolutely. And and that's not to say that a public reciter doesn't do it only for Allah's sake, oh, but, course, what, yeah. what, but that privacy, like, yes, the confidence of, I can do this in my own bedroom and Allah hears me. And that's actually messages I've received, multiple messages like that. For the first time in a woman's life, she's recited out loud in her bedroom for Allah. And, sh and her sharing that that's very different. And you and I both know when we whisper the Quran, it's one thing. When we recite out loud, it's another. It's a different experience. And women deserve that experience privately in her own room with no one else in the house. She deserves that experience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. What was the reception of the app and how has the app evolved so far? So I was very worried that the reception was not going to be excited because we have you know, uh, a five-year plan for the reciters to uh, record the Quran. You know, mm -hmm. every reciter, may Allah bless her. Um, so we have two ways that the app goes. One is the reciters, which alhamdulillah, I'm in touch with every single one of them personally, except for the ones who have passed away. May Allah have so much mercy on them. As you know, the app, alhamdulillah, includes women's recitations from the 1910s and 1920s, and those who have passed away more recently, may Allah have mercy on all of them. And so the ones who are with us, alhamdulillah, here, um, I'm in touch with every single one of them personally. And they send me their recordings whenever they can record them. And we have a five-year plan with the majority of them, inshallah, or most of them, that inshallah in five years, we'll be able to complete, you know, many women completing the entire Quran. But five years is a long time from now. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're looking at an app and you're waiting for, for updates every day. So that's one aspect that they're sending in the recordings. The other aspect is that many of them have already recorded many surahs or many verses. And so they've all given us permission to take what they previously recorded so that we can include it in the app. So a lot of the recitations you might see, you can also find if you, the thing is, you have to know what their names are. How do you spell them? Sometimes you write it in English, it's not going to come up. It has to be in Arabic. They're like, you have to know what to search for. And so the search itself, what I mean, that was a, months and months and months process of finding all the recordings that someone has one verse on YouTube, one surah on Facebook, you know, another one on Instagram, another one on TikTok, that experience, all the volunteers, may Allah bless all of them. They put in so much work to be able to get all of these recordings from each reciter. And so like one aspect of it is getting all these recordings on from, you know, from social media. And the other one is doing the recordings, uh, editing the recordings that we're getting from the Qariyas directly. However, I was very concerned that people are going to open the app. Women are going to open the app and they're going to see every Qariya has, you know, one surah, two surahs, five verses. It's not the whole Mus'haf. The only person who has the whole Mus'haf is Haja Maria Ulfa. May Allah bless her so much. And she's done that recording from years ago. And so everyone else is recording. When we look at apps where we have men's recitations, 
you know, a lot of these apps are just taking what's already online and they're using them in the apps. They're not working directly, doing the editing, putting it into the app. That's a whole process. So I pray, inshallah, that Qariya is the first of many to have, you know, women's recitations accessible, but we are the first. And so I was worried that people are going to open it and say, there's not that much available. You know, why doesn't every Qariya have the entire Quran? Why aren't there more Qariyas from other countries and the search for Qariyas from every country? That itself was a whole journey to get Qariyas from as many countries as possible and <laughs> to have them be qualified and to recite a proper, uh, Allahu Akbar. I mean, it was such a journey. May Allah accept it from everybody. Mm -hmm. So I was worried about all of those things. Like I was worried about the design, about the color, about the logo. Oh my God, everything, subhanAllah. And then the app came out and the reception I just am so grateful, alhamdulillah, for the reception. I'm so grateful. Everyone has been so excited. Everyone has been so emotional. Just the, the messages I'm receiving from the way the, the app has impacted the, 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 the next generation. It's just been such a huge gift to all of us who are working on the app, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, the, the, the reception has been amazing, mashallah. I expected a lot of pushback, honestly. I was preparing for pushback. We had the FAQ ready on qariya.app to make sure that if anyone had an issue with the fiqh, we could say, read the fiqh, you can read it. You know, it's available if you have questions, but everyone was just so supportive and encouraging. And the few people who said something like, um, why are women reciting when men can overhear? You know, there would be a throng of people who were, who were, who were responding to that and saying, men shouldn't download the app in the first place. They just shouldn't download the app. So alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful to say that the reception has been so supportive, so encouraging, so positive. And now that the app has been out for about seven weeks, maybe eight weeks now at this point, seven to eight weeks, um, now people are saying, why isn't there more? Where are the recordings? So alhamdulillah, the initial reception was really exciting. But now in terms of where there are more, the Qariyas are recording. Alhamdulillah, you saw um, today that there was an, there was a recitation added inshallah this week, more will be added as well. So inshallah, that's going to be a rolling process in terms of the, the additions. But alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful that so far it's been a, a wonderful, beautiful reception. Alhamdulillah. Do you have any advice for those who are struggling in their Quran journey, whether it's reading or memorization? Or uh, any advice for someone who's struggling? Yes. Yeah, so the very first piece of advice I would suggest is make your intention, your intention. What is your intention? A lot of people struggle with sincerity. They worry that, okay, if I start and then I memorize, and is it going to be sincere for Allah? I would say the fact that you even want to start is a wonderful, you know, um, uh, uh, demonstration of your sincerity. You, you want to start for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So of course, you know, sit with your, sit with your, your, sit, sit in your room, make dua, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make you sincere, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you successful and make your intention. Do you want to memorize the whole Quran? And you might hear this at this point and say, no, not right. No, I'm not ready for that. Okay. What is your intention? Do you want to just know the Quran? Do you want to live with it? Do you want, what is it? Make that intention and know that even if you do not fulfill your goal and it is not meant for you to, to finish this life with that goal fulfilled, Allah will write you as if you've done it which is why I suggest you make the intention that you want to memorize the Quran, because even if you don't finish, but you work towards it, Allah will count you as if you did, because you're working towards it, inshallah. So the first is your intention. And the second is dua. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your sajda. Make dua as you're walking in the rain. Make dua when you are fasting. Make dua in Jum'ah, ah, make dua ah all the time, everywhere, all in every salah. Pray that Allah opens the doors of the Quran for you. Just keep making dua ah and do good deeds for the sake of the Quran. This is something that my teacher, um, who I was in Egypt with before I met Sheikh Mahib, uh, Sara, Sara, she shared with me do good deeds for the Quran, give sadaqah and make dua, ah, oh Allah, make my Quran successful because of this. Do something and you say, oh Allah, like, you know, cook for your family and oh Allah, make the Quran. My Quran successful because of the deed that I'm doing. So you make the intention that, you know, the good that you do is for the sake of the Quran. And then work with a teacher. Oh, subhanAllah, the amount of times, you know, it took me seven years to memorize the Quran because every single time I would start with a teacher, something would happen and she would have to stop working with me. Mm -hmm. So I would begin and I'd get a little far. And then all of a sudden I couldn't work with the teacher anymore. She moved away. You know, there were so many reasons, subhanAllah. 
I'm finding a new teacher took many months. And then finally I would find a new teacher. And then that teacher would start me all over from the beginning again. <sighs> Alhamdulillah. It was a very long journey because of this. But at the same time, the very first teacher I ever worked with, she asked me, do you want to memorize the Quran or do you want to memorize it correctly? And I was like, I just want to memorize it. <laughs> I want to memorize. I don't want to take any time having to learn how to do it correctly. And she's like, so what's the point? What's the point of you learning it? And then you don't know it at all. Then you have to restart. And I was like, solid. You, okay, that's good. So then we started with the Qaeda and Nurania, which, you know, many people are aware of. It's just, you start the, the letters and, you know, the pronunciation, and then it's a journey to start. So anyway, be patient. It's a journey. It can take you seven years. It can take you 20 years, or it can take you one. But if you're able to say that you started when you were 50 and you ended when you were 70, that for the past 20 years of my life, I have been dedicating my life to memorizing the Quran, subhanAllah, 20 sweet years. How There's nothing to regret. There, there's nothing to regret when you spend those sweet, sweet years memorizing the Quran or trying to understand the Quran or learning the Quran or reciting the Quran, whatever your Quran goals are. So be patient, know that it can take time and work with a teacher. Even if that means you start with a teacher and then you have to stop, and then you find a new one. Maybe your journey of starting and stopping and starting and stopping and starting and stopping is going to lead you to the right teacher for you. And alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful for every single teacher that helped me through the process. But Sheikh Mohib Fulda was the, mashallah, the most incredible teacher who is the most incredible teacher who I'm so grateful for. Not only because of what he taught me of memorization, but what he taught me of loving the Quran and living the Quran. And so sometimes that process is just going to help you prepare for that teacher who inshallah will help you take, you know, the steps that you need to take to inshallah get to your completion. So make sure you work with a teacher and have a support group, you know, find a friend or find a sister. There are online support groups now like Robota, R-A-B-A-T-A by Dr. Tamara Gray, founded by Dr. Tamara Gray. Mashallah, a whole group just focused on women's Quranic recitation and learning Islam. And they have such an incredible support system. Um, and there's also Jannah Institute by Dr. Haifa Yun mashallah a whole system of support of women you know learning the deen and learning quran so inshallah if you're able to find these um, support systems and inshallah in your journey they'll be able to help you in the process as well stay motivated stay you know when those times when you feel down subhanallah there were so many times in my memorization and especially in the continuous review journey where i just feel down and i remember one time I told my teacher, I feel so down. Like, you know, I keep trying to memorize this, this, the surah and I'm not able to memorize it. And she said, well, are you committing any sins that you, that you're, you know, are stopping you from your memorization? And at that time I was living in Egypt and I was like, Sheikha, all I do is go and study Arabic. And I come home and I memorize Quran. My, all I do, I go to Arabic class. I come home and memorize Quran. I go to Arabic class. There's no time. There's no time to do anything else. So it's like, I'm doing more worship than I've ever done in my life because I don't have to go to school. I don't have to work. All I do is Arabic and Quran. So she was like, hmm, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, why you would be having trouble if it's not a sin. And I was like, what am I doing? Am I not doing like enough dhikr, but I'm doing more dhikr than I've ever done in my life. Like what is going on? And then I talked to a friend of mine who had already finished memorizing, who was studying, um, at that time in Egypt, her name is um, uh, uh, Farhia, Farhia, Farhia Yahya. She's known as Fedra Literary. She has a blog, mashallah, an amazing, um, amazing teacher of Quran. And, and she sat with me and she is like, what do you have going on in your life right now? And I told her, you know, I'm helping this person move. This person is visiting just like a bunch of life stuff. And then she was like, your mind is just really busy right now. You just need to take a break. Just take a few days, do the what you need to do and then come back. And that advice from... It's not because you're sinful to, it's just, you just need a minute for your soul to just deal with life. Mm -hmm. Take a few days, deal with what you need to deal with, take a breath and then come back. That really helps shift my mentality because a huge portion of what we hear about Quran is you're just not righteous enough. You don't have enough Iman. You're just too sinful. And of course, there's absolutely a truth to some of that. Of course, we all need more event. We all need to do more righteous deeds. We all need to repent. But also sometimes we're doing all as much as we can and we still don't feel like we have it. And you might just, you might just be struggling emotionally. Work with a therapist, go out with some friends, take a minute to take a breath and then come back to it. And, and having the support system who can help you remember that is so important, subhanAllah. Yes, for sure. Thank you for that. Um, I think a lot of people assume that 
when people memorize the Quran, they just did it really quickly. Like someone asked me, like, how long did it take you? And I replied, uh, I don't know, my whole life, like 15 years. And she's like, no, really, how long did it take? I was like, like I started when I was three and finished at 18. Like it took me 15 years. So subhanAllah, um, thank you for sharing that because I think that no matter how long it takes, I think we should always um, continue may Allah bless you that is incredible what an incredible story to be able to share you started when you were three and you ended when you were 18 Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar incredible subhanAllah and our last question is um, a little bit off topic um, but we um, were looking at your uh, Instagram video about when you were on a skateboard or a longboard and you had um, tripped or had hit a rock and you yeah. flew off um and the first thing that came to your mind was um Allah or like you said Allah instead of screaming so um the question is how did you train yourself to react in that way rather than shouting out something else okay let me share with you where this comes from so you know in the moment inshallah when we're going to you know all of us every single human being is going to have a moment where we're going to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we all want that moment to be the shahada we all want that moment to be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we can't have that in that moment unless we've lived it. You know, we are, or have, you know, have tried our best to intend it. Have, have just, of course, only Allah knows what he gifts every person. But the intention, the hope, the, the, the desire for, the, for our dua to be, you know, throughout our whole lives, let that moment be one where we worship you, where we say the words of the shahada, where we are speaking about, you know, you subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have control over ourselves in that very, very, we, you know, in that moment, Sometimes it could come within a second. You know, sometimes, yes, maybe a person has been expecting it for many, many years. Maybe a person has been expecting it for some time. But what if you weren't? What if it's sudden? And Allah only knows. And may Allah protect all of us and bless us all with, uh, with the best khatima. May Allah bless all of us with the best khatima. But I thought, subhanAllah, how can you be prepared if you're not prepared? And so what I started having my friends and family do was scare me. I am so, I am so easily surprised. Like, I might know you are in the room and <laughs> I might know you're like somewhere in the, in the, in the house. And then, but I don't know you're in the room. And if I turn around and see you, I will, I will be so shocked. And so like, I don't want my first reaction to be to scream. I want my first reaction to be the shahada or Allahu Akbar or words of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what I started asking people to do is to do this, like to just like, you know, scare me suddenly. And what is my very first reaction going to be? And so the reason why I shared that video, I was on my longboard, I hit a rock, I flew off the longboard. And the first thought I had was do not scream, make dhikr. And subhanAllah, it should have been automatic where I don't even have that thought. It should just automatically be dhikr. But the fact that it takes time for you to train yourself. People always ask me like, oh, you know, how do you remember Allah more? Like, I, I feel like I don't remember him enough. It's literally training. Is just training ourselves to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's making sure that when we are walking, we are seeing adhkar, when we are, you know, we are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we're doing anything. We're just trying to the point that we don't even realize our lips are moving. We don't even realize our finger is moving. It's just doing it. And we're like, wow, Allahu Akbar, not even wow, not wow. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah. It's just my body is in such a natural state of remembrance that I don't even realize it's doing it. It's unconsciously remembering Allah when I don't, why are my lips moving? Because I'm making dhikr. Of course, we want to be present when we are making dhikr. Mm -hmm. We want to be present and know. We say alhamdulillah and we are sincerely thinking alhamdulillah. But we also want our subconscious mind to just automatically go to Allah. If we allow our subconscious mind to roam, it's going to be everywhere. It, well, at least mine. Mine is going to be everywhere. It's going to be on what I ate yesterday to my biggest and greatest fears happening tomorrow. Every, it's gonna be everywhere. Wow, what did that person really mean when they said that? Did I do that wrong? You know, everywhere. So instead, why not train our subconscious mind to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the moments where we are doing our routine and in the moments when we're shocked and surprised that our first reaction is to remember him and that I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray that will allow us to live the ayah, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyayi wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen, that my sacrifice, my, my dying, my living, my prayer, everything 
is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that truly, whatever we do until those final moments, until that final moment is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor us with that and make us those people at me. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to um, meet with us and ask, uh, answer some questions. It was such an honor, truly. Jazakallah khairan for, for, for highlighting Qari'ah and for highlighting women's recitation for other women. May Allah bless you so much and bless your Qur'an, Hafidah. Allahumma ja'ala ta'ala nabiyakum bina wa 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 nabiyakum Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha illa and astaghfirullah wa atubu alayhi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.